Morning. Morning. Everybody doing okay? You're good. 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 For those of you who don't know me then, my name is Dale and I'm part of the team that leads at New Life Community Church. This morning we're going to continue our preaching series um, in the book of Exodus and we're going to be following on from Tom's excellent preach last week with the second half. Yeah. Tom, start. (laughs) Have a bit of dignity, mate. (laughs) We're going to explore the first plague where God turns the Nile to a river of blood. And to do that, I want us to look at four things. The first thing we're going to explore is why blood? Why did he turn the river to blood? And then I want us to consider the plague in three ways. We're going to think about a sign. We're going to think about a warning. And we're going to think about a symbol. Before we get stuck into that, before we open our Bibles there, I want to give us a little reminder um, of the context from, you know, the first half of that chapter. So God has charged Moses and Aaron to go to Pharaoh and to command that uh, Pharaoh let the people of Israel free. And Moses and Aaron have obediently gone before the Pharaoh and his court, and they have spoken God's words to them. And as a sign of uh, their authority and that God is with them, Aaron's staff has been miraculously transformed into a snake. And even though the court magicians are able to copy this feat with multiple staffs, actually, Aaron's staff consumes all the others, leaving God's snake as the only contestant and the clear winner. And in the process leaves no question as to who the ultimate authority in the situation is. But Pharaoh's heart was still hardened and he would not listen. So there's the context. If you have your Bibles, let's open them together at Exodus 7. And we are gonna read verses 14 to 25 and see what happens next. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn to blood. The fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, their canals and their ponds and all their pools of water so that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile. And all the water in the Nile turned into blood and the fish in the Nile died and the Nile stank. So the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house and he did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile for water to drink for they could not drink the water of the Nile. Seven full days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. Heavenly Father, as we open your word together, as we, as we are inspired, confused, interested and intrigued about what your word means to us, Lord, I pray, open our hearts to hear your voice. Holy Spirit, I pray 
speak to us clearly that we may grow in our relationship with you from having looked at this together this morning. Amen. So even though the court magicians then were in fact able to copy this feat, God made it clear that he was the one in charge. And now we see him once again demonstrating his authority. In verse 14 we have this acknowledgement from God that Pharaoh's heart was indeed hardened. The NIV uses the word unyielding, like a rock or a boulder. It's not only hard and impenetrable, but it's, it's heavy and unmoved. That's the state of Pharaoh's heart. Unmoved by the pleas of Moses and the people of Israel and unyielding to the authority and the command of the Lord. I want to ask this question quickly. Why? Why is Pharaoh's heart so stubborn towards God? Yes, God hardened his heart by giving him over fully to his natural desires and attitudes. But where does his confidence come from? What's the basis of his audacity, his belligerence and his contempt for the command of the Most High God? We have already seen the contents of Pharaoh's heart in chapter 1. As he commands the death of all the newborn newborn Hebrew males in a perverse attempt at population control. But that evil and rebellion against God is rooted far deeper than his heart. It's fed and it's fueled by the whole Egyptian culture, which itself is interwoven woven with their pagan religious beliefs and practices. In Egypt at this time, there is a deity for every daily need. There's a God for every season and an idol for every occasion. God knows this. He also knows that the Israelites have been living in this culture for generations and that their hearts are tainted and enticed by association. So God moves his plan to stage two. No longer will his miraculous signs be performed in private before the elders of Israel and the court of Pharaoh as they have been up to this point. They will now be performed publicly in plain sight so that both Israel and Egypt can witness firsthand the efficacy, the supremacy and the authority of the one true God and in turn the inadequacy the inferiority and the impotency of the Egyptian gods so in plain sight of everyone God causes the river Nile to turn to blood but why blood why did God choose to turn the river to blood he he could have caused it to turn into anything right He could have caused it to turn from fresh water to salt water. Or he could have caused it to turn into jelly and custard, for that matter. He can do what he wants. He is God. So why blood? must be a reason. The Hebrew word used here is dam, and it means lifeblood. Leviticus 17.11 talks about lifeblood. It says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus 17 14 for the life of every creature is its blood the blood is its life as human beings we know this right as a squeamish human being I know this more than most as many of you know I've suffered in the past with kidney stones and uh, I had another bout of them during the first lockdown at which point I was in so much pain I actually had to go to hospital And uh, I remember a lovely nurse took me aside into a room to do a blood test. And after I had nearly passed out at the sight of the needle, um, she drew two whole vials of blood from my arm. She'd put a cannula in and just sucked that stuff out. And uh, 
after I'd wrestled with the reality of whether I could actually survive without that much blood in my system, <laughs> I, uh, I actually felt something warm on my arm where the cannula was. I thought, that's weird. And I, I looked down and opened my eyes. They were closed, of course, in case I saw blood. And I looked down and saw blood spurting out just all over the floor, all over my trousers, all over her. I was like, nope, nope, nope. That's not supposed to, that's supposed to be inside, not outside. And I quickly closed my eyes again. <laughs> she, um, she just giggled at me, actually, and she said, oh, sorry. <laughs> I forgot to turn the tap on. What do you mean? <laughs> Honestly. That's just a silly story of me being a wiener, actually. But um, in ancient history, blood tests, before blood tests or transfusions or actually any real medical knowledge, people knew that blood was supposed to be on the inside, not the outside. And they knew that any time they saw blood on the outside, chances are death probably wasn't far behind. So when God turns a whole river to blood, that is a powerful sign, is it not? A potent warning of death. So I've said the river of blood was a sign, but not for Egypt. The sign was for the people of Israel, and here's why. If you, those of you who remember, in Exodus 5, we read that the people of Israel, God's chosen people, had just had their spirits well and truly broken by the harsh treatment of Pharaoh. Not only did the Israelites now have to forage and gather their own straw to make bricks, but they have to make the same number of bricks as they did when their masters supplied them with straw. And when they couldn't deliver, they were beaten for it. To sum up where their heart was at this point, the foreman came to Moses and they said, you, you've made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants. They don't believe that God is at work. They can only see the struggle and the hardship that they are currently facing. And they don't remember God's promises over them. And they don't trust him to be faithful to his words. But once again, God had predicted this exact turn of events. In chapter four, we read that God gave Moses three signs to perform uh, before the elders of Israel to confirm that it was indeed Yahweh, the one true God, that had sent him to them. The first was Aaron's staff turning into a snake. We saw that. The second was Moses' hand miraculously becoming leprous, and then as he put it in against his cloak and brought it out, he was healed. And then in verse 9 of chapter 5, we read, If they will not believe even these two signs... And this is talking about the elders of Israel. If those guys won't believe these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Can you see that in turning the Nile to blood, God confirms his authority and sovereignty, not to the Egyptians as such, but to the beleaguered, battered and disheartened Israelites. Imagine what an encouragement that would have been. You're oppressed by your masters. You're worked, your fingers are worked to the bone and there's no hope. And now you get up one morning and the river is turned to blood. It doesn't look like blood. It is blood. This is the very miracle that God said he would do to prove that it was he that was with them. Imagine the encouragement, the hope welling up in your heart as you look out and see this sign. It was unmistakable, unmissable. This, then, is God's sign to Israel that he knows their suffering and that he is outworking his plan to free them just as he promised. 
Interestingly, in a dramatic and visceral reversal of status, it's not the people of God who stink to Pharaoh. It's now the Nile, and by extension, the people of Israel, who stink before God. So if the river of blood is a sign of God's favour over the people of Israel, then it is also a warning of God's judgment over the people of Egypt. You see, it points back to a time when the Nile metaphorically ran red with the blood of the Hebrew infants killed at the order of the Pharaoh. And it points forward to the coming plague of the death of the firstborn and the Passover, which we will cover in chapter 12. But it also points to God's categoric victory over the gods of Egypt. And it serves as a warning to Pharaoh and the people of the fate that awaits them. You see, the Nile wasn't just a river to the Egyptians. It was their heart and their soul. They relied on it not just for the transport of goods and trade, but as a source of irrigation for their crops, for drinking water, both for themselves and for their livestock. And the annual flooding of the Nile actually provided a layer of rich silt that made the land fertile, fruitful and cultivated in a way that the surrounding land was not. No wonder then that it was associated with a number of their gods. Like the god Happy, I presume that's how you say it, who blessed the land with life and the god Kenyum, who controlled the flow and flooding of the Nile. These were ancient and powerful gods capable of delivering abundant blessing to the Egyptians or causing crippling famine and poverty. In the Egyptians' eyes, these were gods that had to be petitioned and placated in order to secure a good harvest or a good catch of fish. Their influence was felt throughout the land of Egypt. Everywhere the Nile waters were, the gods were there too. Their manifestation was seen in the rippling waters, in the flowing currents. But in one moment, God utterly, utterly humiliated them. He used a man holding a stick to turn the dwelling place of the gods into a bloodbath. In turning the river to blood, the gods at the heart of Egypt were shown to be completely powerless totally dominated by Yahweh, the one true God. The river that gave life to the land of Egypt became a river of death, unable to support even the fish that roamed its depths. This was God's warning to Pharaoh. It's as if he said, look what I've done to your so-called gods. See how easily I have subdued them do you think I will do any less to you? Do you think you can withstand me any more than your gods can? But we read, Pharaoh turned and went into his house and he did not take even this to heart. So we've considered the river of blood as a sign for the Israelites and as a warning to the Egyptians. But now I want us to consider it as a symbol for us. As we've read, the uh, magicians were once again able to deceive Pharaoh by copying God's handiwork. But crucially, they weren't able to reverse the effects of God's miracle. For seven days, the Nile remained blood. And not just the Nile, all the pools and waterways and the water in their pots and cups and buckets, all of it was turned to blood. Nothing was clean in the whole land of Egypt. Everything was polluted. It's not a natural phenomenon. And so it didn't naturally end. It was an act of God and therefore an act of God to restore it. After seven days, God restored the Nile. 
And in restoring it, he clearly showed that only God has the power of life and of death. Imagine, imagine the Egyptian priests and magicians praying out to their gods over the Nile. Please turn it back to water. We need, we need water to drink and live. And the gods remain silent. Only God can outwork his judgment and decide when it is finished. Only God can restore things to the way he intended them to be. And only God can turn a symbol of death into a symbol of life. Friends, brothers and sisters, that is exactly what he did at the cross. God took the judgment we deserve for having hard and unyielding hearts towards him and he spent that on himself in the person of Jesus so that Jesus could declare as he was nailed to that cross, now it is finished with his final breath. God allowed us to crucify and kill Jesus on the cross, to spill his lifeblood in our place, to let out what was on the inside to the outside. And we know that that's bad. But even though Jesus died, God reversed his death. He restored him to life and began the process of restoration for all things. Unlike the Nile that only spoke death and judgment to the Egyptians, the blood of Jesus speaks a better word. God took blood, a symbol of death, and through Jesus turned it into a symbol for life and life eternal. Life is in the blood. And Jesus gave his for you. We're reminded of this whenever we take communion together. The wine represents Jesus' blood that was spilled for each of those who love him. Every time we look at that, our hearts are lifted. Joy fills us. Hope fills us as we know that God has taken a symbol of death and made it a symbol of eternal life for us. But guys, don't be deceived. There are magicians at work in our day as well. People and institutions that try to deceive us and convince us that just like God, they can provide salvation, restoration and life. But like the magicians in Moses' day, they can only go so far. They cannot reverse death. They cannot reverse the judgment of God and they cannot restore things to the way they should be. Only God can do these things. So we must not be deceived. We must look to the symbol of Jesus' blood and cling to the one who shed it for us. In conclusion then, let's look to the sign of Jesus' blood and know that he is with us and for us and continues to outwork his promise of salvation over us. Let's look to the warning of Jesus' blood and not allow our hearts to be hardened and unyielding to the call and command of God. And let's look to the symbol of Jesus' blood that speaks love, life, forgiveness, rescue, restoration and relationship with God. Amen? Yes. I'm going to ask the worship, worship team to come back up and we are going to, we're going to worship our Heavenly Father. Maybe you don't, maybe you've come here this morning and you actually, you don't know about the blood that Jesus spilled for you. Maybe you hadn't heard that before. I want to tell you, he loved you so much that he gave his lifeblood for you. And if you would like to have a conversation with me at the end, I'd love to unpack that in more detail with you. Maybe you don't need me to do that. Maybe you just want to respond this morning right here, right now. And as we worship, I'll just encourage you to pray. Thank you, Jesus, for spilling your blood for me. 
I want to yield myself to your call and command on my life. Maybe you're here this morning and you have felt enticed, deceived by the world that seems to offer some of the things that only God can really do. Maybe you need, maybe you've even, maybe you've even worshipped some other things than God. This is a moment to respond now in worship, to repent, to come before your heavenly father and say, I'm sorry, God, I have, I've put other things in place of you. I've been deceived. I've been enticed by the things of the world. And now I want to humble myself. I want to come and yield myself to you again, to your authority and your call over my life. Maybe you're here and you just think, praise you, Jesus, for the lifeblood that you've spilled that has purchased my soul for eternity. And maybe we just now come before our Heavenly Father and worship and praise him and give glory to the King Jesus. Amen.